Welcome, Vintage Hollywood Archive. John Wayne called her a tomboy. British actor David Nevin said she was the most beautiful Italian invention since spaghetti. The Los Angeles Times Magazine named Cardinale among the 50 most beautiful women in film history. Among men of a certain age, Cardinale enjoys special status as, variously, a primal inspiration a breathtaking vision, and an earthy turn-on. How Claudia Cardinal pretended her child is her brother. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Vintage Hollywood Archive channel. Claudia Cardinal, Queen of Telluride once upon a time with Claudia Cardinal. Claudia Cardinal, a wonderful actress and idol for many generations of audiences. Very communicative and organic, joyful and open. She was admired all over the world. More than 150 films from a career that started by accident and a life that reads like a movie script. From jealous scenes with Robert De Niro, unrequited love for Marlon Brando and the child she had to hide to the masterpieces of cinema like The Leopard, Once Upon a Time in the West, and Fellini's Eight and a Half. Meet Claudia Cardinal. In the history of cinema, only a handful of stars, Sophia Loren, Gina Lolo Brigida, Monica Bellucci, have seriously competed with Claudia Cardinal in the va va voom stakes. But even these close rivals can't match Cardinal's mind-blowing work ethic. I love to work, says the prolific star. Usually you live only one life, but I've lived 154 lives. In a movie, it's not you, it's someone else, it's something else. She clearly has a solid wall beyond which prying inquisitors are not allowed. Her great leading men, with whom she always paired up so strongly, Lancaster, Wayne, Belmondo, Marvin, Fonda, Dellen, Robards, Gassman, Niven, et al., were uniformly fantastic, although she made a point of saying that she had a policy never to have a romance with an actor. On that score, however, she did express one qualified regret. No sooner had she arrived in the mid-60s on her first visit to Hollywood, where she would eventually make just a handful of films, than she had a knock on her hotel room door. When she opened it, she beheld Marlon Brando, who obviously had finely tuned radar concerning the arrival in town of hot new imports. He was enormously charming, funny and, she said, the most beautiful creature on the planet, along with Bridget Bardot. But I didn't, she said, adding that, as soon as he left I thought, I'm very stupid. The first film she had ever seen in Tunisia, she remembered, had been on the waterfront. Despite having seen most of the important films of her more than 50-year career, we don't know much about her life. Most surprisingly, Italian was her fourth language, one she didn't even begin to learn until she was a teenager. She was born in Tunisia to third-generation Sicilian immigrants, went to French schools, spoke Sicilian dialect with her family, and learned Arabic on the street. Her mother, Yolande Greco, was the daughter of Sicilian immigrants. Her father, Francesco Cardinali, was born in Gela, Sicily and worked with the railways. Cardinal grew up with two brothers, Bruno and Adrian, and a younger sister, Blanche. She initially wished to become a teacher, and was actually studying at Teachers College when her life made a big turn. Like many other female Italian film stars, Claudia Cardinal's entry into the business was by way of a beauty pageant. Her first attracted attention in 1957 
after winning the Most Beautiful Girl in Tunisia contest. Her prize was a trip to the Venice Film Festival, inspiring her to pursue a career in acting. I was helping my mother and people from the Italian government organize an Italian film festival in Tunisia. I was looking at the girls on the stage, and I wasn't supposed to be there. Someone pushed me out on the stage, and I was named the most beautiful girl in Tunisia. She was 17 years old and studying at the Centro Sperimentale in Rome when she entered a beauty contest, which resulted in her getting a succession of small film roles. Her earthy interpretations of Sicilian woman got her noticed by Italian producers, and the combination of her beauty, dark flashing eyes, explosive sexuality, and genuine acting talent virtually guaranteed her stardom. As soon as she moved to Italy, she became one of the most celebrated Italian actresses, reaching an international fame. Claudia Cardinal conquered Italy. When she arrived in Italy, it was her first encounter with her roots. She felt that she was Italian. She recognized herself in its sobriety and taste. After having appeared in a couple of locally made films, including one starring Omar Sharif, her career boomed. Her looks were noticed, and she began to work with famous directors, such as Visconti and Abel Gaines. Soon after seeing the movie White Nights by Visconti, which impressed her greatly, she won a role in Rocco and His Brothers. Visconti's Rocco and His Brothers, Bel Antonio, and the big local hit Girl with the Suitcase, the latter, directed by Valerio Zurlini in 1961, was shown in its entirety at the tributes, but does not hold up well. While Cardinal is quite good as a spurned nightclub singer lusted after by the teenage brother, Jacques Perrin, of her errant boyfriend, it's an arid, almost stultifying affair with little of the boisterous energy of the era's best popular Italian fare. Inspired to act, she still had difficulty with the language, and her early movies were actually dubbed. She realized that she was talented at acting, even though she remained in the shadow of Sophia Loren. Regarded as another Italian sex symbol by many, she became Italy's answer to Brigitte Bardot. She was also a fan of Brigitte Bardot. Who could not be? When she was young, she was her idol. She loved her elegance and her natural power. Claudia found a mentor in the older, famous Italian producer, Cristaldi. He made her enter into an exclusive contract with him in 1958. This forbade her to cut her luxurious, long, glossy hair, marry, or gain weight. He also chose her movies, and he chose them well. She was noticed in Girl with a Suitcase, and appeared on many magazine covers. Long considered one of the world's great beauties, she has appeared on more than 900 magazine covers in over 25 countries. A photograph of Cardinal was featured in the original gatefold artwork to Bob Dylan's album Blonde on Blonde in 1966. However, the picture had been used without Cardinal's authorization so it was removed from the cover art in later pressings. Her career probably never reached its full potential, although she won prizes and received good reviews for many of her roles. The classic film, The Leopard, was probably her best. This was dominated by the autocratic Burt Lancaster, but Cardinal played a fiery Italian woman to perfection and had great chemistry with Elaine Delon. Cristaldi couldn't stand any scandal and was extremely controlling, so Cardinal couldn't have any romances with her co-stars, although it must have been tempting. She also said that it was against her policy to become involved with her co-stars. I never felt scandal and confession were necessary to be an actress. I never revealed myself or even my body in films. Mystery is very important. Cardinal became pregnant through a relationship with a Frenchman. She gave birth to a son, Patrick, who was presented as her brother. She didn't tell people that he was her son until he was 19. Her mentor, Cristaldi, 
helped her by sending her to London for the birth and also kept the whole thing a secret. Cardinale's son, Patrick, grew up with Cardinal's parents. In 1966, while she was working on her Hollywood films in the U.S., Cristaldi joined her. They got married in Atlanta. However, the marriage was not made official in Italy. Cristaldi adopted her son. The couple split in 1975. Throughout the 1960s, she appeared in some of the most acclaimed Italian and European films of the period. No question that 1963 was a peak year, as Cardinal co-starred in two of the most celebrated Italian films of all time, Eight and a Half and Visconti's The Leopard, with Blake Edwards, The Pink Panther, tossed in for good measure. Visconti and Fellini, she said, were completely the opposite. With Visconti, it was like theater. You always had to be silent between takes. With Fellini, it was all improvised. He needed lots of activity on the set, with people on the telephone, talking, singing. If it was quiet, he couldn't create. The clips shown from those films were stunning, of course. She was acting perfectly in Panther, in which Parrying with seasoned light comedy pro David Niven, she willingly and humorously melts under the influence of champagne from Virgin Queen to giddy accomplice in good times. One of her most well-known roles was that in the epic western Once Upon a Time in the West. It would prove to be an interesting departure from some of her idealized previous roles, even if only slightly. Leone's arid, dusty epic is set during the waning days of the American frontier, as an encroaching railroad is set to be constructed over a valuable tract of land known as Sweetwater. This property is sought after by the cruel outlaw Frank, Henry Fonda, who cheerfully murders the property's rightful owner and unwittingly leaves the man's widow, Jill McBain, Cardinal, the sole inheritor of the land. Threatened on all sides and seemingly helpless to the vagaries of the violent men around her, Cardinal's woman refuses to be cowed. She bravely defends her late husband's property. When hero harmonica, Charles Bronson, strides into town to enact revenge on Frank for separate reasons, he too is drawn to Jill and strives to protect her and her land. Finally, Cheyenne, the local criminal framed for her husband's murder, Jason Robards, also circles around the woman, leaving her in a precarious and complex situation. On the face of it, it'd be easy to make the argument that Cardinal's role in the film is not especially progressive. Without the protection or respectability afforded her by her husband, she's a piece of meat for the taking in Leone's conception of the Old West. It almost goes without saying, there are pretty clear limitations on the feminist credentials of most 60s spaghetti westerns. In his decades-spanning gangster film, Once Upon a Time in America, it may be that Cardinal's imperiled pioneer widow is empowered only by a matter of degrees, stuck in a dirty and dangerous frontier that frequently made victims of its more vulnerable inhabitants. But she is the overruling force at the center of the narrative, not so much the sole driver of plot, but one whose appraisal of the actions of the violent men around her matter deeply to the narrative. It's through Jill's eyes that we survey the emptiness of her machinations, the needless bloodshed at their hands, the greed that Leone is so intent on underlining. Her affection for Harmonica and for the unfairly framed Cheyenne, Jason Robards, gives them credence. There is an archetype for a role like this one, and perhaps in some way, it's as inflexible as putting her on a goddess-like pedestal. Leone sees Cardinal in the mold of the woman as survivor, witness to the cruel deeds of men. But she is also maybe the most sympathetic character in the film, beset by the predatory motivations of even the good cowboys around her. This is a woman as idea, symbol, abstraction, not in her full humanity. But perhaps the entire film is made up of movie myth and archetype, with its shimmering vistas and riveting close-ups. Once Upon a Time in the West 
is as much a reflection of cinema past as it is of the historical frontier. Cardinal fiercely and defiantly embodies her role, rolling around in the dirt rather than swanning around in pristine gowns, and there's something to be said for it. Perhaps it's evidence that Leone was giving thought to the roles and sufferings of women in the grandiose death and glory landscape of the American West. Perhaps Leone thought about it more than many might give him credit for. Ennio Morricone famously wrote his scores to Leone's films prior to the shooting, and Cardinal said she accompanied the director almost every day to Morricone's home to hear the composer play his ideas on the piano until both he and Leone were happy. She then loved it when the music was played on the sets and locations when scenes were about to be shot, the only such instance she's known in her career. She much admired Robards, later her co-star in Werner Herzog's Fitzcarraldo, before the actor left the legendary traumatic shoot, but said that Bronson was totally introverted. He's always in a corner, never speaking to me or anyone. With Fonda, there was little chance for much intimacy. On the day when we were shooting our love scene, his wife was sitting right there by the camera. Cardinal evidently had no problem with the adversities of Fitzcarraldo saying, I love crazy people. Normal is boring. She achieved her greatest Hollywood success playing a beautiful princess in Blake Edwards' great comedy and starred in a few Hollywood westerns. However, Cardinal chose to act mostly in European films because she didn't like the Hollywood system and their method of signing stars to exclusive contracts. I don't like the star system. I'm a normal person. I like to live in Europe. I mean, I've been going to Hollywood many, many times, but I don't want to sign a contract. Eventually, Cardinal, a free spirit, grew tired of Cristaldi's controlling influence. She told the LA Times in 1975 that, For more than 15 years, I was considered and treated like an object or a project to be manufactured and merchandised. They divorced each other that year. When Federico Fellini coined the term paparazzo in La Dolce Vita, it was precisely celebrities such as Cardinal he was thinking of, hence her role as a movie star in Fellini's follow-up Eight and a Half. She came into her own just as post-war Europe was shaking off realism and rationing and embracing glamour and sensuality. Like her French counterpart, Bridget Bardot, Cardinal came to embody those values. For me, cinema is a dream, she said. The most beautiful thing. I don't like to see a banality in films. I want to see something that makes you think and dream. Her performances in Visconti's Sandra, U.S., of A Thousand Delights, U.K., is regarded as mesmerizing, as a Holocaust survivor having an incestuous relationship with her brother. In Comencini's La Storia, from El Samarante's novel, Cardinal plays a widow raising a son during World War II, meeting another well-received performance. Other memorable performances include Valerio Sorlini's Girl with a Suitcase, and Mauro Bolognini's Libera. Cardinal remains active in European cinema throughout the 90s. In the 1980s, she did a brief stint in the Falcon Crest CBS series. Claudia Cardinal now works as a UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador because she believes strongly in helping women achieve higher status through education. She said that, it is with passion and dedication that I will be attentive to the needs of women and fight relentlessly for their rights. Claudia Cardinal is of strong liberal political convictions. She has been involved in many humanitarian causes, feminist and homosexual causes, and has frequently stated her pride in her Tunisian and Arab roots, as evidenced by her appearance as herself in the Tunisian film A Summer in La Goulette. She has been living with the director, Pascal Squiteri, for a long time. They have a daughter named Claudia. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you are new here.
Yeah, yeah, yeah.